they're trying on their identity to figure out who they really are. And that's okay. And it's okay if they change their mind and it's okay if it's just a phase because that doesn't matter, honestly. We deal with the present not as much with the past or the future. Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. My name is Tiffany, I am a school psychologist, and today we're going to be talking about ways to support the LGBTQ plus community as a school psychologist and educator. And because I'm not necessarily an expert in this um, topic, I brought Cece with me, who is an intern and a soon to be school psychologist, and I am going to let her introduce herself. Yeah, hi, my name is Cece. I use she, they pronouns. I identify as non-binary and I'm also pansexual so I'm all types of rainbow uh, and I have known my identity since I was a sophomore in high school I went to the same graduate program as Tiffany which is so awesome she's actually my mentor so I'm so excited to be here and chat about this very important topic so number one is to educate yourself. And I feel like this is always a great place to start. I guess when you're like starting to learn about like a certain community or learning ways to like support um, your students just to educate yourself. And I feel like there are a lot of resources out there. Something that Cece mentioned um, before we started recording is the gender bread. Is that what it's called? Yeah. I was yep, going to say gender, gender bread man. Person. And I'm like, wait, that's wrong. Person. Person. Yeah. We are gender inclusive with our gender yes. bread person. Absolutely. It's a great resource. Over the, There's a few different versions of the gender bread person, but the latest one is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, actually, that's a lie. The version 3.3 is one of my favorites. So on the gender bread person, you can see that they're, they kind of break down identity um, and gender in general uh, into like four, three different parts, four different parts, uh, with the first one being gender identity, and then there's gender expression, biological sex, uh, and then like sexual attraction, because one of the first things that you really have to understand in order to work with this community is that our gender identity and our biological sex, two different things. Um, and that can be really confusing or a, a really new concept to a lot of people, uh, especially because like when we fill out documents for the government or job applications, these terms are used interchangeably, uh, but it's not technically correct, right? So uh, it's important to acknowledge that, that we have our biological sex, which is like our bits, you know, what we got physically, um, internally as well, like our homo hormones and the chromosomes that we have, uh, whereas our gender identity and gender expression is how we communicate um, the way that we feel as a person. So that could be you know, I want to present more feminine or more masculine, or I don't want to have a label on it at all. But um, the genderbred person is a really nice little infographic to kind of break it down so that you can see how it's not a binary, because that's like the whole point of their, our community is that there's more than just one or two options. Yeah, I love the graphic. I love how it's it kind of shows that it's like a spectrum. You also mentioned intersectionality when um, we're talking about like like educating ourselves and like labels and names. So it jumps into my mind when I think about um, intersectionality with this community uh, is the term trans massage noir, which is about the unique experience faced by specifically uh, black trans women. This is important to acknowledge because it's not just gonna be homophobia or hate that's targeted for this community, but it's also gonna be racism, or sexism. So there's layers of systemic issues that uh, just put these individuals at a more vulnerable risk. Right. I mean, I guess intersectionality, like in general, is like when things layer on, like we're culturally diverse, we're also women. And so I'm sure if you're also in this community, you you face other um, you know, discrimination and issues. So I think it's really, really important to talk about. And what I was going to say before is I think a lot of people get like the um, gender identity and biological sex confused because a lot of people just say gender. And like you look at like even our um, IQ tests and it just says gender MF and that's it. And you, you just have to check one. And so I understand why a lot of people um, don't know yet or like it is confusing, um, but I think it's a great time to educate yourself. Yeah, which speaking of like, our testing, cognitive testing, there are some items on some tests, will not be named, that um, I think are clearly 
uh, bias against this community because like there might be a question out there like what type of person or who wears a dress or something like that and it's I don't know it's a little outdated um, especially because we are not the only culture that exists right American Western culture and there are cultures where masculine individuals or men wear dresses or skirts or whatever so just something to, to think about. Number two, uh, using preferred pronouns and uh, preferred names. This is so important because we're recognizing and saying that accepting a, a student's identity, um, and it's legally what we have to do, right? It, it's our job and ethically as educators or school psychologists to um, affirm that child when what they're going through and make them uh, less at risk for things like homelessness, uh, suicide, um, self-harm, because uh, this community, especially the youth in this community, are at an extremely high risk for poor mental health outcomes, for poor education outcomes, because they're not going to school. I actually have some statistics that we could share uh, to go along with this. We always love data. <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, according to the National School Climate Survey, from GLSEN, uh, like 51% of LGBT students felt unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation, uh, 42 because of their gender expression, and 37 because of their gender. 32% um, missed at least one entire day of school because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable, and 45% avoided bathrooms, <laughs> excuse me, because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable. Similarly, 43% avoided locker rooms. So that's a substantial amount of this community that isn't feeling like they have a place or belong inside of their school community. It, it's a new situation for a lot of districts um, to really acknowledge this formally. And I know even our district is in the process of um, having a more standard procedure for things like, what do you do when my student you know, wants to go by a different name or different pronouns? And you know, doing so makes a teacher uncomfortable or makes the class, someone in the class uncomfortable, another student even, you know, so um, I'm glad that it's starting to pick up awareness. It does seem like the law is not quite going the way that it should be, according to research, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of people, a lot of educators who are well, you know, they have that base of I want my students to succeed. And once they, you know, I feel like once everyone understands that if we don't help them, it's not like they're going to fail a grade. It's they can lose their life. According to the Trevor Project, which is another organization that supports this community of students, 40,000 youths, LGBT youth were, were surveyed. And that's when 40% of respondents um, seriously considered attempting suicide. So that is quite an amount of students that, you know, feel so hopeless that they consider, you know, suicide. Yeah. And we're talking about kids here, right? And like, they're, you know, their brains are developing rapidly. They're starting to like form their identities. Like this is when they like need the most support. As, you know, experts in child development, we know that adolescence is meant for exploration, right? They're trying on their identity to figure out who they really are and that's okay and it's okay if they change their mind and it's okay if it's just a phase because that doesn't matter honestly we deal with the present not as much with the past or the future right we're here to help that student um, obviously be successful in the future and like recover from any traumas from their past but ultimately we're here so that their present day is better because that leads to the better future. They're not gonna do their homework or pay attention during math if they feel like life isn't worth living. Yeah, right? definitely. At that point, like academics, like they they take a backseat. Yeah. We want to make sure like they're socially, like mentally, like emotionally, like present and you know, that they feel safe and, and secure. When we have a vulnerable population, just like we would for any student with another type of vulnerability, whether that be a marginalized identity and another capacity, we protect them. Great. So I'm going to leave all of those resources um, in the description box below. Another way to really uh, support our students is 
you know, just being conscious of the language that we're using in our everyday conversations. It's very easy to have gendered language, um, especially in Spanish, because like our whole language is gendered. But there are alternatives. So like instead of saying, okay, you guys, let's, you know, whatever, or okay, ladies, let's do, you know, you could say, all right, y'all, you know, if you're in the South, like us, all right, y'all is a great way to do it, or okay, everyone, or, you know, there, there are alternatives, and it might not seem like a big thing, but to a student who is just figuring out what their identity is, it can, it can be a little sign that you're a safe person. Number three is to create a safe space, and this could be by like decorating your your office or your classroom or um, even like setting like rules and boundaries in the beginning, like, you know, talking about like being respectful and inclusive. I think having those like conversations and rules in the beginning um, of like, whether it's like a group session or whether it's class, I think those are really important. Something I really want to add to my office is a rainbow flag. <laughs> um, and I also have like a sign that says, this is a safe space. I mean, not saying like, oh, that means everything but I feel like it's just it's a way to I guess show like where you stand absolutely it's so important to have a way for students to know that you're safe without having to say it out loud because it doesn't need to be a conversation right it could be as simple as just having a little rainbow flag or even um what I've done too is just complimented the students rainbow gear that they might be wearing like I remember walking down the hallway in a high school once and there was a student with Crocs who had little like pride pins on their Crocs. Um, and I just complimented that and offered if, you know, if they needed to talk about anything and, you know, just having that little introduction so that they can feel safe is, I mean, that's, that's very valuable. Even having like that one adult like could make like such a big difference oh, yeah. because there are a lot of adults in the building that might not feel comfortable or maybe they they have different differing opinions and beliefs and mm. yeah it's it's difficult number four is read the room and what we mean by that is we don't have to make it a huge deal when a student does come out to us if they choose to do so right um we never want to pressure them. We never want to assume. And if they do choose to share whatever um, identity that they're exploring, the best thing to do is just to say, okay, do you want to talk about it? And not really go like, oh, you're so brave. Oh, you know, because what children and individuals in the community uh, like, like personally, I, want to be accepted as if I'm saying my zodiac sign, right? As if I'm saying another, like my my nationality, like sharing that kind of thing. I don't want it to be something that turns into, because um, it, it, it can amplify the situation when it doesn't need to be. Number five is to start or support something like a GSA, a Gay Straight Alliance. Um, I think in my school, we're going to start a Rainbow Alliance next year, which I'm really, really excited for. Um, I know even back when I was in high school, we had a club like this. So I, I'm i a little disappointed that some schools still don't have something going um, just to support your students who want to be a part of that and who want to be, you know, have a community in, in their school. Absolutely. and. They're actually not called Gay Straight Alliances anymore. We've updated our terms. It's usually referred to as the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. Um, so it's still the same acronym. This also, I think, ties back to our alphabet soup to name our community LGBTQIA+. You know, plus. Um, it becomes a mouthful and it is lumping together a lot of different things because we have gender identity there, we have sexual orientation there. Um, we can even have uh, like biological sex, like I can stand for intersex. So, or it does stand for intersex. So there's a lot of different terms that are kind of lumped together. And I think it does make like the mission behind what these groups or, or you know, what educators are trying to do it, it does lose a little bit of its meaning because people can hear that and either feel overwhelmed because it's so many letters um, and so much new information that they have to learn um, when at the core of it 
the way to support your students is generally the same, right? The way that we're going to support a lesbian student and a bi student, trans student is more or less the same because we've got to um, affirm their, their exploration and their identity, especially in middle and high school, elementary too, because it does happen in elementary. A lot of people don't think it does, but as young as three, kids can know. So just don't be surprised. Yeah, to just support them and make them feel safe and like they belong. But yeah, the GSAs, they're, they're a great way to help out your students. Um, according to the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, listen, about 62% of LGBT students said that their school had a GSA in 2019. So it'd be great if we could get that a little higher so we can support the majority of our students because they're yeah. everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. There's going to be a gay person there. So um, going back to what you mentioned, I love how you like corrected me. It was like non-judgmental, but like, you know, you're educating me. And I, I feel like if we can have these like open conversations and like, you know, no judgment, we're just, we're here to like support each other and learn from each other. And we're doing it for, for the kids. I feel like that's a step towards like the right direction. Yes. Um, and that reminds me of the point that I wanted to make that uh, it's okay to make mistakes, right? Most individuals will not be offended if you mistake their pronouns or, you know, you slip up and maybe you use their dead name. Um, it's maybe uncomfortable, but we understand that it doesn't come naturally to you and, or like to the, the person that made the mistake. And it's not, a huge deal as long as that person will correct themselves and, and just you know be more aware of it in the future it, it's totally okay to make mistakes and it's expected the best thing really is to just kind of jump in and start where you're at and uh, meet your students where they need to be met so I guess as a concluding question and like discussion point like have you seen a difference in how the LGBTQIA plus community is um, treated like when you were in college versus grad school versus like in the workplace now that you've interned for you know almost a full school year from going through college undergrad and grad school it was always very accepting very open a lot of events uh, to promote LGBTQIA plus um, like students but I was fortunate and I went to a very diverse school and I went to um, a school in Northern Virginia that is very accepting that area in general. So I know that that probably has something to do with my experience in the workplace. It's definitely different. Um, I do have my pronouns and like my email signature uh, and I've tried to encourage myself to share it like in person, but that's still a little uh, scary for me because when you have pronouns that are unexpected, like I'd say, or, or or maybe like not unexpected, but pronouns that you have to come out with, like you have to come out and share your pronouns. It's scary because coming out doesn't just happen one time. It happens anytime you meet a new person or you're in a new setting and you never know what the reaction is going to be. So I can definitely say that in the workplace, I was not as confident with being as open with my identity, um, especially as I was working in, or I'm working in an elementary school. So I just, there wasn't a lot of signage or, or indicators of direct support from, you know, the people that I was working with. Not that I think that they would have, you know, been impolite or rude to me at all, um, but it, it does, you know, color the way that people would look at me and maybe even talk about me. So I was just more nervous to be my authentic self. I'm getting better at that now though, um, because I need to practice what I preach. Uh, <laughs> and I know that visibility of the children seeing someone who, you know, I'm not that different. <laughs> um, it would, it can help, you know, just knowing that someone ha lives their life that way, that that's an option. You know, it's not a bad thing, um, but it does make me nervous, especially with parents. I get very nervous and I never um, or I haven't yet shared um, anything like that with parents. Um, one, because time and place. Right. It's we're not there to talk about my my identity, but also just, you know, with uh, being multicultural. I know that there's a lot of cultural factors that can go into how individuals um, perceive the LGBTQIA community. So I just I'm careful. Um, I have uh, had colleagues who have um, been discriminated against for their uh, 
identity as being a part of the rainbow community. Um, it's very di disheartening to hear that that person had to go through that because they are amazing and incredible and such a great like school psychologist. Um, but it happens. Um, I will say that they are, uh, you know, not in North Northern Virginia. So that makes me feel like I'm, I'm even more sheltered just being in this area where this is a more a progressive area, but I have heard of situations with my colleagues or, you know, and that it's, it's sad to hear because if it's happening to adults, I can imagine what's happening to the kids. While I'm not yet to the place where I feel like I can be out and proud all the time, uh, I'm headed in that direction. <laughs> Definitely. That's what we like to hear. Thank you so much, Cece, for being on here with yeah. me and for, for chatting and like educating all of us. Uh, I'm so thankful. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is such an important topic to really educate ourselves and do better. And um, especially given the, the horrific laws that have been passed in Florida and, and the talks in, across the country. Thank you everyone for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Instagram and um, TikTok. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.